onto the um, webinar portion, you can email me at robin at sanctuaryfederation.org and I'll help you get signed in um, once we get started. Just let me know kind of what the issue you're having is. I do also want to mention we are recording this webinar. Um, what's nice about the recordings is you can go back and review any information you've missed. Um, if there's other members of your team that you think would benefit from this information, they can definitely go ahead and do it. So um, once a day or two after the webinar, we'll send some follow-up information. We'll send you the link to the recording. We'll also send you information about part three of this webinar series, the date and that kind of information if you're interested in registering for that. Um, and we'll also send a follow-up survey that we'd love to um, get your responses to as you have time. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type those into the chat box. Your presenters love to take your questions. If we don't get to your question right away, don't worry. We've made a note of it, and we will pass it along um, towards the end when there's a Q&A. But, but please feel free to type your questions in as you have them. So again, just for those of you that might just have joined us, I'm Robin with Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with any distraction from background noise. We get a number of people on the phone at the same time. But please feel free to type any questions you have into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, also, if you have issues with the volume with any of the presenters, please type in there and let us know that also. So now I will go ahead and let us get started. I am going to first pass this over to Kelly Heckman, who is the Executive Director of Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. You can get started. Great. Thanks, Robin. Um, I appreciate all of the the background and your support. Um, so yes, this is our second webinar of the three-part series. Uh-oh, we're going too fast. Who's doing that? Um, so this is the third, uh, second part of our three-part avian protection welfare series, uh, which you know, we are sponsoring and, and is being organized by the Avian Welfare Coalition. So my, as Robin mentioned, I'm Callie Heckman, and I'm the direct, executive director for GFAS. And for those of you that have not heard of us, um, maybe didn't hear the, the or see the first uh, webinar, uh, we are an international accreditation organization that evaluates sanctuaries, rescue centers, and rehabilitation centers all over the world for all species except for dogs and cats, um, who obviously have a lot of advocates of their own. And we have generated standards of care and operation for 25 different groups of animals in which we evaluate any organization, big or small. It is our goal to promote the activities of those organizations that do meet our standards, provide them with a seal of approval to grant makers, donors, and the public that use our accreditation as a resource. And we promote the development of these organizations through different educational opportunities which support organizations' abilities to meet and exceed our standards. And we also want to seek out um, to eliminate the cause of displaced captive animals through public outreach such as today's webinar. And we use opportunities like today's webinar um, to support the community, community of animal-loving people in which uh, our objectives and missions all overlap in you know, supporting the care of uh, displaced animals. So it is our hope that we can increase awareness of the issues that are out there and reduce the need for sanctuaries in the future, but also make sure that the animals that uh, are out there that need care right now um, get that support in, in the short term. So for GFAS, in supporting these webinars and workshops, our objective is to first provide you with the necessary information for providing that short-term care for the birds that come into your uh, facilities for need. And then if you manage an avian sanctuary or rescue, we encourage you to begin the application process to become certified organization with us. And you can learn more about that um, and our standards and application process on our website at sanctuaryfederation.org. We also hope to support the networking between uh, you all in the sheltering community with accredited sanctuaries and rescues in order to build relationships now before you find yourself in a crisis situation. 
And in general, we want to support the responsible placement of animals at qualified organizations. We want to put an end to the growing problem of displaced birds, and to do this, we need to be more mindful of where we send the birds that come through our sheltering facilities. And with that, I want to now hand it over to Denise Kelly, who um, is with the Animal uh, Avian Welfare Coalition, and let her say a few words. I know she's not feeling well today, but she's <laughs> she's the president and co-founder of the AWC, an alliance formed in 2000 to raise awareness about the plight of parrots and other captive birds and to serve as an educational resource. Denise has done an amazing job as an organizer for this webinar and, and the complimentary workshop series that's um, uh, gone. We've had one event in New York, but we'll be launching several more events um, in 2015. And um, I'll let her take it from here. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm Kelly. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I have a raging cold today, so I hope I don't sound too bad. I'm delighted that so many of you have come back for part two. I see a lot of uh, familiar names here. And welcome to our newcomers. Um, I do hope um, those of you who did not join us on part one will take the opportunity to view part one with Dr. Anthony Pilney. And um, we've gotten some terrific feedback, and I'm really so encouraged by the di dialogue we've begun with some animal shelters that have shared some of their experiences with birds with me. And I can tell you it's good. We have so many dedicated people in animal shelters um, out there, and using their uh, resources I think will only enhance our goals. I um, wanted to keep my comments brief, uh, but as I mentioned in the beginning of part one, one of the key goals when we formed AWC back in 2000 was to address the growing need for shelter and sanctuary for displaced birds. And we really did feel that the resources of the animal welfare community were well established and that we should certainly tap into those to help captive birds. Um, often animal shelters and humane societies are the only resort uh, for unwanted birds. So we decided to begin an avian shelter outreach to do that, to help shelters help birds. Um, our first initiative was a handbook that we had published, uh, Captive Exotic Bird Care, a Guide for Shelters. Um, members of our group then began presenting avian care webinars at shelters and humane conferences. And in 2000, we made a series of downloadable how-to guides that we put online uh, for shelters. These were written expressively for shelters. Um, so now the final is to expand our online resources via this avian care webinar series. Um, I just want to mention that all of these initiatives are intended as guidelines for caring for birds in the short term, in shelters, animal care facilities, and as well as in perhaps uh, less than ideal or emergency situations. Um, and we also acknowledge the fact that the vast majority of cat and dog shelters operate under enormous challenges and may not necessarily be equipped to deal with birds. So we'd like to put ourselves out there as a resource and to help them wherever we can. Um, as I mentioned in my intro in part one, um, you can all rest assured that the Global Federation and AWC support far higher standards for birds in permanent sanctuaries and those that will be placed into private homes. And Kelly Heckman has already summarized that the GFAS accreditation process is a rigorous one and aimed at providing accountability to all the aspects of animal care and holding facilities to the highest standards of ethical organization management. And I think we'd all agree the animals deserve no less. The focus of this series is to better prepare shelters that care for birds in a shelter setting and to make sure the birds are placed to the best possible situation for their individual needs. Um, also, I um, wanted to mention for most of the topics covered in this series, we do offer a corresponding downloadable how-to guide with more details on that topic. And that's available at uh, avianwelfare.org backslash shelters. Lastly, I would just like to uh, reiterate that although the subject of birds in captivity evokes a very diverse variety of opinion, 
regardless of how we feel as individuals, we have an ethical responsibility to provide the best for those already with us. And it's not really about the bir- uh, us, it's about the birds. So keeping these points in mind, I'd like to now turn this over to our main presenter, Lorelei Tibbetts. Uh, Lorelei is currently the practice manager at New York City's only exotic pet hospital, the Center for Avian and Exotic Medicine. She's originally from Boston, receiving her BA in journalism from Boston University, and then a BS in veterinary technology. Lorelei has worked exclusively with exotic pets since 2003, and in addition to being an adjunct teacher of avian and exotic medicine at a local veterinary technology program, she's lectured at several national veterinary symposiums. She's also a founding member and the current president of the Vet Tech Specialty Group of the Academy of Veterinary Technicians in Clinical Practice, where she specializes in exotic companion animals. Laurela, you're on. Thanks, Denise. Thank you. Uh, just our, I just wanted to mention this is our disclaimer, and these will be the um, topics that Lorelei will be covering today, housing, cleanliness, and sanitation, environmental safety, nutrition, managing stress, and enrichment. Great. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, I, think, I think one of the things that is most daunting to people who work in shelters or are thinking about incorporating birds into their uh, rescue organizations is, you know, how do you properly care for them? I think it's, there's a lot of mystery involved with how to properly keep them or even just temporarily make sure that they're um, cared for in, a, in the best way possible. Everyone is real familiar with how to care for dogs and cats. And like Kelly was saying earlier, do a great job for dogs and cats. But when you start talking about exotic animals, particularly birds, everybody kind of freezes up and says, oh my gosh, what do we do? What do we need? How, what do we feed them? Where do we put them? So hopefully this uh, will help to kind of demystify some of that um, scariness, I think, that is involved because it's such a, there's such a huge need for it. Uh, and it really can be done safely and in a way that is going to be beneficial, I think, not only to the birds, but to the staff. I think it's enriching to people at shelters to be able to help um, other kinds of species. And the more we educate ourselves and, and each other about how to care for them, I think it, it, it's only going to be positive. So we can start by touching on, on housing, you know, the proper way to keep these birds when they're in a temporary setting. I think it's, it's really important, first of all, to reiterate what Denise was saying, that there's really no way to keep these birds um, in captivity, quote, properly, especially not in a shelter setting. So, you know, we can do a better job in long-term care and in um, people's homes when we have the ability to really give them a proper environment or close to proper environment. But in a shelter setting, we're just kind of looking at the minimum that we need to keep them safe and comfortable. So a few things to remember is that Birds are really, really social. When you look at them outside, they at minimum are usually with a bonded pair, but usually even within that bonded pair, they're, they're traveling in large flocks. They fly miles and miles a day, um, hunting for, for food and playing and grooming and bathing and doing all kinds of fun bird things. So really what we're looking at here is what are the minimum housing standards that we need need to provide them in order to, to keep them comfortable while they're with us. What I, what I usually tell people, clients, when they come in, because a big question I get is, well, how, how big of a cage do I need to get for my pet bird? Well, the answer I give you is the same answer I'm going to give them, the largest enclosure that you can afford and will fit in your space. You know, these birds are supposed to be flying, like I said, miles and miles and miles a day. So there's no, there's, there's no real guidelines as long as you're aiming for the best. Um, of course, large cages are expensive. We want to maximize the space that you have. So if you want to talk about kind of minimum guidelines, I would focus on making sure that these birds have at least two or three perches, the ability to climb around from perch to perch, stretch their wings out. Remember that a, a bird, when they open their wings, their wingspan is 
significantly wider or longer than the size of, of the bird is. So you want to make sure they're able to do that and stretch comfortably. There should be room for them to have toys and different food cups and things like that. Um, you know, use the best judgment that you that you can. And you also want to take into account how long that bird is going to be there. You know, a bird can survive in a very small enclosure for a, a day or two. So, you know, if you're really serving as just an overnight or as a short term stay, you probably don't have to focus too much on size and, and, and um, enrichment and things like that. But if they're going to be with you for a significant amount of time, you want to try to make things as comfortable as you can. Bar spacing is a big deal with these cages, and people ask me this a lot because when you go shopping for bird cages, there's all different kinds of um, bar spacing sizes. So these are some good guidelines to go on. But you know, the main the main thing to think about is that you obviously don't want them to be able to fit out between the bars of a cage. Um, then you also don't want even just their head to fit through. I've seen a lot of times birds will put a wing out or a head out between bars and they can get stuck or get hurt. Um, when, you know, if they are able to get their head through the bars and they get spooked or panicked, they can really hurt themselves. So, you know, the smaller birds, the spacing shouldn't probably be more than a half an inch um, or even smaller. Um, cockatiels, small conures, things like that, probably three quarters inches one and a half for the medium Amazons and the grays. And when we're talking about the larger birds, the big cockatoos and macaws, you, you can get some of the larger spacing, a quarter inch um, space further apart is usually fine for those birds. And usually when you're looking online, you know, there's good, good and reasonable recommendations on most websites if you're shopping for, um, for bird cages. So this is um, some examples of what birds would look like in, in their enclosures as far as sizing. Um, you know, again, this would be an appropriate cage for these size birds as a love bird. We have a Quaker parrot and a small Goffin's cockatoo here. These cages would be appropriate probably for fairly long term. Um, if these, these birds have a lot to do in these cages, and, and that's great. There's toys, there's perches, there's ample space for them to move around. And this would be kind of something you'd want to aim for if the birds are going to be with you for any significant amount of time. A really important thing to remember is, is how these cages are constructed. You don't want to just buy um, or even accept, if you're accepting donations, cheap cages that have bendable bars, you know, a bird's beak is capable of cracking coconuts and large nuts and ripping bark off of trees or anyone who's ever been bitten by a bird knows they are very, very strong. So you want to make sure that these cages are really sturdy. Um, I have seen many, many birds, especially the kind of clever birds like cockatoos that are able to escape from cages. They put their little foot out, their toes out, and they're able to actually flip locks, open um, little um, latches so that they can escape. And you want to make sure, depending on the species of bird, that they can't do that. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of cages, especially some of the older ones that can have toxic metal or toxic substances if they've been you, know, you don't want to buy a cage that's been repainted by someone that you know in their backyard on craigslist you want to make sure that these are cages that have a, a powder coated paint or something that is non-leaded you know something that is not toxic to birds and obviously be careful with wood cages i see these cages all the time and usually they're meant for finches and canaries, the little wooden cages, and they're very beautiful. They're more you know, ornamental than anything. But of course, most birds, other than finches and canaries, are going to be able to chew right through wood given a little time. I think it would be really fun for them, but it's probably not something that we should be encouraging in the shelter because um, these birds are going to get away. As a general rule, we want to um, aim for cages that are square or rectangular. The round cages have, um, there's just, there's some controversy about whether or not birds are more comfortable in cages that don't have corners. Um, outside access to food and water can be really important. The cage here with the, with the macaw is a good example of one. If that, if that bird is a, a vicious bird and, and you've got shelter employees who are scared, you may not want to have you want to have the ability so that you can actually open the cage and change the food and water from the outside so you don't necessarily have to reach your hand in there and risk that enormous beak you know yanking on one of your fingers so try to think of that when you're when you're setting up your avian area um, and certainly you want to have a 
um, large amount of different perch sizes and textures. I talk to clients a lot about, you know, when you when you go to a pet store, and especially when you buy a cage, they usually have these like starter perches, which are basically a dowel. That's a, you know, a wooden dowel. And you want to, I mean, those are okay if that's only one of the perches in a cage, but really you want different sizes, natural wood branches. They make like the one again in this picture that is made of rope um, so that they can have exercise for their toes and they don't develop sores from always being on a perch that's the exact same diameter. I always, I describe it to clients as, well, you wouldn't want to be wearing one pair of shoes and never be able to take them off for your entire life, you would develop weird calluses and sores. Um, and that's what it's like for a bird that only has one kind of perch with one diameter. Um, as far as the outside play areas, of course, this is going to depend on your shelter and on your comfort level and your space. But it would be great if these birds could have some time to play outside. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. The placement of where you put these cages is also important. Um, birds are, are nervous prey species for the most part. They don't like being um, in a situation, especially when they're in a cage and can't get away where there's a cat staring up at them or barking dogs or anything that might be making them uncomfortable. So you definitely want to keep them not in a general population with, with predatory animals. Um, Healthy birds can and probably should be housed in the same room. Like I mentioned, they're flock animals and they certainly should be in a, in a situation where they can be together as long as they're in good health and a veterinarian has given you know, permission for that. And you wanna absolutely provide sufficient space between cages. I do think, I've seen a lot of birds, they can stick a foot out between the bars and grab each other. Sometimes a beak can come through. So if the cages are really butted close against each other, they actually can um, hurt themselves. There's a question here um, that reads, can we talk about space considerations as far as co-housing birds together, birds that are already social with, with each other? Um, Birds that are together, and I will mention this again later, that come into the shelter situation as a bonded pair should absolutely be housed together. It, it would be considered cruel to separate them. Um, it's going to give them comfort in what is going to be a really stressful time of rehoming, and they should at, at all costs be kept together. As far as introducing new birds in a shelter situation, I would not recommend that. Um, you never really know what birds are going to want to be with another bird. And unless you have staff with a lot of time to observe and make sure that birds are getting along, it's probably not the best idea. Um, as far as space considerations, when you have birds together, um, you know, if you look at the cages in this image here, there's a little white cockatoo. Um, that is in a very comfortably in that size cage. If you were to put another one in there, probably they'd be okay if they were a bonded pair and liked each other and didn't, you know, didn't mind that they were sharing one or two food dishes. Uh, certainly, if you had birds that were not terribly familiar with each other, that would not be okay because they're going to have territorial issues and you're going to want to have multiple food dishes to decrease them fighting over things toys, food dishes, and things like that. So, you know, birds want to see what's going on. Um, you want to make sure that they have the ability to kind of visualize what's happening in the room. But by the same token, they also need privacy. Uh, I think it really makes birds nervous. A lot of times clients will ask me, you know, their birds having a, some behavior issues at home, and I'll find out that the cage is in the middle of the room of their living room. Um, and I think birds need a place to kind of feel secure. Being against a wall or in a corner like this cage is a good way to, to make sure that they feel a little more confident. Giving them toys or hiding things that they can kind of hide behind so that they don't have to be like on display all the time is a good idea. And definitely, again, in times of stress, that's going to alleviate some of that fear of, of always being looked at. Wherever you keep the birds, heat and temperature is a big deal. Um, there does need to be good ventilation. Birds release a lot of dander. So certainly, you know, air purifiers and good ventilation is important or you're going to see a dust accumulate much faster than in a regular setting. 
as far as temperatures, people are always scared that birds, you know, shouldn't be kept cold. You know, they live in the jungle, they shouldn't be kept cold. And, and that's partially true, but it does actually get quite chilly in the evenings. And, and, and most of the environments where these birds are from, it can go down into the 50s and 60s for sure. Um, so, you know, you can acclimate these birds to cooler temperatures as long as it's not really drafty. You know, you don't want it to be because they're sitting in front of an open window or a vet, an, you know, an air conditioning vent or something like that. So you want to make sure that they're just, whatever the temperature is, it's, it's a constant and it's something that they've kind of been weaned onto. And absolutely, they shouldn't be kept on the floor. Um, if there's a mop bucket or something, you don't want to keep them near cleaning supplies like I mentioned, in front of air conditioners or things like that. Not, not a good idea for birds. These are some nice images of um, ways to give a bird environmental en enrichment. Um, birds are so smart and so social and so animated. If you take a bird, a parrot like this, and you put it in a cage with a perch and a, you know, and a bowl of sunflower seeds, they rapidly become stressed out. Um, they can exhibit this with behavioral problems, whether it's feather destructive behavior, like the little lovebird you can see up here has some feather destruction, um, or screaming or biting, they get bored. Um, even these small birds, they're so, so intelligent. They're used to being, uh, you know, out in the, in a, their, their, their little innate senses are to be foraging for food and, and hunting and playing and mating and taking baths. So what you want to try to strive for, even in a short term setting, is just giving them things to do, um, whether it's fun toys. You don't necessarily have to buy really expensive toys at the pet store. You can make them. I mean, we always make toys here in the veterinary hospital out of tongue depressors and popsicle sticks and things like that that birds like to play with and shred. Um, it certainly, you can take donations of bird toys. And again, there's also some nice, you can see images in these pictures of good um, different kinds of perches, natural wood, things for them to chew on, fluffy things, soft things. So, you know, you can really disguise the limit as far as how to give them um, enrichment in, in their environment. So what happens if you're in a, in a shelter situation and you don't have some of these nice cages that have either been purchased or donated to the, to the shelter? Well, does it mean you can't accept birds? You just have to be a little more creative about it. Um, you can use these pet taxis that people transport cats in and easily convert that into a makeshift short-term bird carrying um, cage. The one here that, that we kind of rigged up is a, would be a perfect size for, um, you know, anything from a, a kayak, conure, even up to a small Amazon could be in there for a day or two if need be. Again, an emergency situation, it has food, water, it's clean, a comfortable perch, and it's going to be safe. Um, on the other side here, these picture, this is just a one of the cage, cage banks that we have at our practice. And yes, there are bars in the front, which makes it convenient, but um, most vet hospitals or shelters do have some kind of cage bank situation that you could kind of rig up like this. In the back of this cage, you see there's a PVC pipe. We just go and we buy these PVC pipings and attach them and those make great um, makeshift perches that are easy to clean. And the rules here are sort of the same for any of the other rules we we're talking about as far as bar spacing, make sure the bird's head can't get out. You don't want to create that out of wood. Um, even plastic, like this pet taxi is really strong, but if you put a, a cockatoo in, in, a, in something like this or, or a large parrot, they're, they're probably going to be able to get right through that plastic in a, in a couple of hours. Um, and just be sure that if you are doing one of these makeshift enclosures that, um, that it's secure so they can't, they can't escape. So now we're going to touch a little bit on cleanliness and sanitation, because I think for birds, I mean, obviously with dogs and cats, you you're need to keep things clean, but birds are a little different. Um, their, their bodies are made up of um, air sacs in addition to their lungs. You know, they don't have a diaphragm. They have this incredibly efficient respiratory system, which is what makes it easy for them, you know, able to fly long distances, but it also makes them more susceptible to environmental toxins, mold, fungus, bacteria, things like that. Um, and you have to be very, very aware of this when you're trying to house birds. 
So things like, you know, food, um, you can see this picture of this macaw gourd, you know, having a delicious meal with fresh fruit, it's wiping, it's all over the, um, the branch there. If that doesn't get cleaned off in a couple of days, that food's going to mold and get rotten, um, and the bird might step in it, chew it off their foot, and that could be introducing some things that we don't want the bird to ingest. So we want to be careful about removing all of these dishes every day and cleaning off the, um, the perches and things. So these are some guidelines to go by, um, minimum guidelines, I would say. Once a day, we want to clean and disinfect water and food dishes, at least once a day, I'll say. Again, this is kind of minimum. The paper that you use on the bottom of the cage, whether it's newspaper or whatever you're using, should be cleaned at least once a day. Any debris, uh, food, poop, whatever, that kind of lands on perches and toys should just be wiped off. It would be great if twice a day we could have water changes. Um, and remember when you change water in birds, wipe the dish. I can't tell you how many times people come in with their cages and, you know, you stick your, you clean the water and you stick your finger in the bottom and it's really slimy. And that's because the water, is, you know, they, they might change the water, but you actually have to clean the dish. Um, Giving a bird a spray bath is something that's really important. It says once weekly, but it certainly could be more. Um, somebody asked a question here about dusty cockatoos and we'll address that, but one of the things that helps to keep dust as a, to a minimum when you have very dandery or dusty birds like cockatoos and um, African greys, giving them baths helps to decrease that amount of dust that they give off. And again, it's environmental enrichment for them that they generally really like. Just plain water. You don't need to use anything in the water. It's just water. I always tell clients it doesn't rain, rain aloe from the sky or any soap. Just water is good. Um, and then certainly depending on how long these birds are staying with you, the cages should be completely disinfected at least at least once a month and certainly between um, birds that have that have been there in the, um, you know, in between different birds that are going to be kept in the, ca in the same cage. Um, getting to some of these questions here, somebody asked, can you address housing a dusty cockatoo in the same room as a macaw? Macaws are very sensitive to dust, as I understand it. Well, all birds are sensitive to dust. I think what she's referring to is some macaws um, have a have a reputation for developing an actual allergy or hypersensitivity to cockatoos, um, and that is true. We we do see that more in macaws, and it happens to be often when macaws are housed with cockat with cockatoos. I don't know that this is going to be a big problem in a temporary setting like a shelter. If two if a macaw and a cockatoo are living together, it might be something you would address if they're living in the same room. But if you follow these cleanliness and sanitation guidelines, it won't be a problem and certainly not for short term. Um, and then somebody else is asking about dog and cat um, in shelters. For them, they emphasize spot cleaning when it's possible. Would cleaning bowls with soap and water or wiping off be sufficient? And yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think I think we don't have to go crazy and be putting dishes through an autoclave every day. But Cleaning them, wiping them out with even just soapy water is gonna is gonna be good. And like so, take take for instance this perch. I don't know that I would remove the perch from the cage, scrub it, brush it, dry you know heat it, dry it. I would just get in there with a wet towel and wipe the debris off on a daily basis. And then again on the monthly basis, yes, then you want to go in and and be more thorough with your cleaning. Um, so cleanliness and sanitation moving on, I think this will address the answer to the next question as well, which is about effective ways to disinfect. Um, at our practice, we actually, um, we every six months will change our cleaning disinfectants because we don't want to build antibiotic resistance. And we'll use trifectant, triside, chlorhexidine, and different things that are safe for hospital use. Um, those are certainly also safe for birds. Soap and water is great as long as you rinse it thoroughly. There's also this, um, people sometimes are very scared of using bleach. And certainly if you're using um, non-diluted bleach around birds, that is gonna be a very toxic smell to them. And it's not something you would want them to be breathing in for a long period of time or certainly to ingest. But if you dilute it properly at one tablespoon per gallon and, and rinse it thoroughly, you're going to be fine. 
what I usually just recommend to people is to make sure you have a good 10 minutes of contact time, especially with bleach. Bleach is a great cleaner. It kills everything, but it needs that contact time and it needs to be rinsed well if you're going to use it. Um, for birds, you want to avoid certain things. Um, cleaning products uh, like Lysol or some of the really uh, noxious smelling cleaning products can be really dangerous for them. Plug-in air fresheners, which I think are actually even toxic to dogs and cats, are, are highly toxic to birds. Um, the room should be smelling fresh because you're keeping it clean, not because you're spraying things in the air. Talking about substrates a little bit, um, the best thing is just newspaper, hopefully stuff you can get for free or that's been donated, or plain paper if you know they make all different kinds of cage paper and things like that. You want to definitely avoid sawdust, wood chips, corn cob, shavings. People like these because they think, oh, I'll put this down and then I don't have to change it for like a week or two, so it's less work. But then what happens is the birds poop and throw food down it gets wet and it grows mold and fungus and those are the really dangerous things that will aerosolize and can make birds sick so certainly don't ever use anything like that just change the paper every day okay um, as far as food and water dishes stainless steel is um, generally preferred it's very easy to clean you can put these through an autoclave if you want in between birds that are staying with you but ceramic and plastic work well. Um, I generally try to use those for dry food. Water bottles for birds, and I know a lot of people use these. Again, I think it's an issue of they don't like when birds take baths in their water dishes, which to me is crazy. We should encourage birds to be taking baths in their water dishes. Um, yes, it can be messy, but it's water and it's natural for them to do that. So I think it's a, it's a good idea to use. Um, but not water bottles are just something that is not natural for birds, um, and I just strongly don't recommend it. Um, moving on to environmental and safety considerations. When you want to create a room, say you have four birds, if you're creating a, a, a room that's specifically just for birds, which hopefully you'll be able to do. These are some of the guidelines to focus on. You want to make sure that they won't be able to escape, meaning not just from their cage, but actually from the room into the general population. Um, electric cords that are hanging, if you have lamps or heating devices or air purifiers or whatever. I have had here many birds that unfortunately have reached through their cage and actually been able to chew on an electric cord. So you need to be really careful about that. I think the theft of birds is something to consider as well. You know, these are valuable animals um, and you don't want to have them in an area that is readily accessible to the public. You want to be sure that they're not going to be, uh, a, you know, a lure for people who may want to want to steal them. Um, injury from other birds or other animals is obviously something to worry about. Toxic substances such as, you know, as I mentioned before, um, wet mop buckets, things like that, keep them away. And then the extreme heat, cold, or draft. Just try to keep the keep the bird room away from all of these um, possibilities. So there are definitely some things that are maybe not harmful to dogs and cats that actually can be harmful and even fatal to birds. Uh, cleaning agents, floor and furniture polish, air fresheners. Um, if you are in a, in a shelter that's doing a lot of flea and tick baths, you may wanna make sure your birds are in an area away from these substances. Um, Insecticides and pesticides, if these birds are near a window and they're spraying outside for whatever reason, you'd want to keep, keep the windows closed. Um, a question just came through about how toxic are candle fumes, uh, especially the scented candles are really toxic. You don't want these birds to be exposed to anything like that. The only candles that are, I guess what I would say, quote, safe for birds would be the soy-based candles. Um, the all-natural ones that don't have um, scents, but even then, I don't know why you'd want a flame burning near a bird anyway, just for the risks of that. Um, scented health, you know, um, health and beauty aids like perfume, 
um, again, the scented candles, I would stay away from, we mentioned bleach before, ammonia goes right along with that. One thing I don't know if um, everyone is aware of, but we try as hard as we can to educate um, our clients is nonstick coated cookware are really, really toxic to birds when they're overheated. This isn't just something that we talk about with, with pots because most likely in a shelter, you're not going to be, you know, making cookies. Well, maybe you are, I don't know, but um, we're talking about space heaters, um, appliances, hair dryers, blow dryers. A lot of times the wires are coated with PTFEs or the fluoropolymers that are toxic to birds. So if you are using any of these devices, read what is actually coating the, the heating elements. And if it does have any of the PTFEs, um, don't use them anywhere near birds because if they get overheated, that can be really toxic to them. Um, and then obviously airborne toxins, as I mentioned before, they have really sensitive respiratory tracts, cigarette smoke, air pollution, um, paint, varnish, solvents, all these things are going to be toxic to them. So, you know, I think it's something to, it, it sounds really scary. It makes it seem like, oh my gosh, these birds are really sensitive. It's, it's just kind of common sense as far as if it smells bad to you, it's probably toxic to birds. So um, just consider that. I know it's not something we think about all the time with, with dogs and cats. Somebody just put a post that they heard most wicks are lined in candles, even in soy candles. That's very possible. I don't, I don't know. I don't use candles, and I generally tell people don't use them, even the soy ones. Like I said, if for no other reason than why would you want a fire in your house, um, you know, burning near your bird? And certainly in a shelter setting, I don't know why you'd be burning candles either. So probably would recommend not doing that. So moving on to avian nutrition. This is a complicated topic because um, a lot of the nutritional requirements for these different birds are, are really largely unknown. These birds come from all over the world, from, you know, Central and South America to South Pacific and Australia. Um, this picture of these macaws is one that I actually took when I was in Costa Rica, these beautiful scarlet macaws eating the red palms. Well, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but we don't have these growing in our backyards at New York, in New York City. And I think probably anywhere nearby, they're not. So these birds are supposed to be eating that. And we're not going to be able to offer that to them um, in a, in a setting where we keep them domesticated and in captivity. So I'm going to make some recommendations about the kind of what, what we currently think of as the ideal diet for birds nutritionally. Um, and I want to just make a little caveat that when they're in a shelter setting, that, that probably isn't going to be the most important thing. And I'll, and I'll go over what, what I mean. So unfortunately for, for birds um, in captivity, most people, when they go to the pet store, when they buy birds, they're, they're told and given, you know, the bird starter kit and it, and it consists of a bag of sunflower seeds and safflower seeds, maybe some spray millet. And that's what they give their birds. And it's not until they come to the vets years later or, or hopefully, you know, go online and do a little research, they find out that there are other options for them, that these birds should be eating other things. So remember when the birds come to you in a shelter environment, they're probably in 99% of the time going to be um, what we would call seed eaters. And they're probably used to eating seeds. So I'm going to recommend giving them other things, but keep in mind that you may not want to just um, cold turkey give them a new kind of food right off. The most important thing when they get to you in a shelter is that they're eating. So I would definitely have to have some seed mixes on hand to give them. That being said, we want to also give them some other things and introduce some new foods into their diet. There's no reason that you can't start seeing, well, what might like they like? Would they like to try some more nutritious human foods? Would they like to have some spinach or some pumpkin or some, um, you know, grains or, or other fresh fruits or things like that? Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with introducing them to these foods when, uh, when you get the birds in the shelter. Just be aware that you don't want to, you know, boom, switch them onto what we would consider to be the best kind of diet. And then, of course, access to clean, fresh water at all times goes without saying. So in general, birds really do require a variety of healthy foods that's um, appropriate to their, their size. 
even though there's a picture of a Senegal eating an entire apple down there. <laughs> He's going to have fun with it, even though it's much bigger than his body. Um, the first thing I'll mention in case you guys haven't heard of it before are what we call pelleted diets or commercially made pelleted diets. There's many, many different brands out there and they, we market them as, you know, the same thing that a dog is for, uh, dog food is for a dog, which is like an all inclusive diet. But as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of this, we really don't know what these birds are supposed to be eating. And I highly doubt that a cockatoo is supposed to be eating the same thing as a Quaker parrot. So, you know, yes, commercially made pelleted diets should ultimately make up the majority of birds' food. It does have a um, vast majority of the staples that these birds need as far as nutritional elements and minerals and vitamins and things like that. Um, but we should be supplementing them. We should be giving them healthy human foods. They should be getting fresh vegetables. They can eat just about anything that humans do other than, in case you guys don't know, avocado, which is toxic to birds. Um, and certainly we should keep them away from things like chocolate and, um, and junk food, overly salted junk food and things. Um, they can have raw nuts. They can have uh, and, you know, we've listed almonds, pistachios, walnuts, really anything here on this list, as long as, I, again, I try to get people to give raw organic if possible, maybe not in a shelter setting, but um, do the best that you can when you're introducing these kind of healthy foods into their diet. Um, somebody put a, po a question up about people feeding dried mealworms and chicken to a parakeet. Is it healthier than the pellets or seeds? And can we use, quote, meat to feed budgies? And I'll, I'll alter that or I'll answer that not just for budgies, but for any birds. Um, so, so birds are omnivores. They can eat meat. Um, they, they probably do ingest a fair amount of bugs in the wild. And that probably makes up a portion of the protein requirements that they need. I don't know that they're out there hunting chickens and things like that, but they might eat some, um, if they find some carcass of some kind, depending on the species of bird, they might uh, try to taste some of that and get some protein that way. And it is safe to give them these foods if you want to share some of your meals with these birds. It's not, they're not going to die if you give them a little piece of chicken or meat uh, or anything like that. That being said, you know, you, you don't want to overfeed them any of these things. And no, it certainly does not take the place of a pelleted diet. Um, it would be something that you would offer them as a kind of just an adjunct to the the main part of their diet, which should be a commercially made pelleted diet and fresh fruits and vegetables. And of course, somebody mentioned here is factory farmed animals given growth hormones and antibiotics. Well, that goes, you know, that goes for our vegetables and, um, and, and our meats. If you, if you are going to be giving these things to birds as a people, you always want to try to avoid things that have, um, any kind of growth hormones or antibiotics, things like that. It's just, it's magnified for birds. If it's not good for humans, it's really not good for birds. But again, that's more long-term, you know, and when they're in a shelter setting, I don't know how much you need to worry too about that. Some kind of interesting species that you may come across in a shelter setting that have different nutritional requirements, um, lorries and lorikeets, if you've ever heard of these birds, they're, they are, um, they have these really cool tongues. We call them brush tongues. If you look at them, the tip of their tongue kind of spreads out like a paintbrush. And they use that to eat nectar from flowers in the wild. Um, they will eat some fruits and soft veggies and things, but primarily they're nectar eaters. Well, this is obviously a difficult thing for us to provide for them in captivity. And therefore, we do have some formulated nectar diets that they should be eating. Um, it's the best that we can do for them in captivity. The brands that I generally recommend are Missouri or Necton. They have some good lorry nectar diets. If you happen to come across a lorry in your shelter and you don't have that food readily available, you can use some natural juices, um, baby foods, um, applesauce, things like that until you get the proper nectar for them. Um, but, you know, obviously, you, if one comes into your shelter, you're going to need to feed them something. So you want to go with fruits and, um, and juices and things like that until you get them the, the, the nectar diet. Um, 
Doves and pigeons are another one. They they do make commercial mixes for them that have seeds and cereals and, and um, things like that. Those are fine for doves, but I do try to encourage people also to get them on the commercially made pelleted diet. Um, you can use parakeet or canary seed mixes. They like spray millet. Um, one thing that you would definitely want to consider giving doves and pigeons, if you're giving them seed mix, is they should have some sort of grit or some sort of uh, something that will help grind down those seeds. Because unlike parrots, they don't hold the seeds, so they need to have literally rocks in their gizzard to help grind that um, food down. Um, and don't forget that even though they're just pigeons and doves, they, they can certainly eat anything as well. So, you know, go for it and offer them some fresh greens and, and fruits and veggies and stuff as well. A lot of people have pet chickens, and I kind of have this feeling in the shelter setting, you're going to come across a lot of chickens because they're, they're very frequently um, abandoned or abused and neglected and, and overbred. Um, so setting them up, you know, they, they make a lot of different kinds of um, game diets that are absolutely fine for them. Um, I have found in my experience, chickens love to eat bugs and love all kinds of uh, mealworms and waxworms and all those kinds of things. But you can also give them soybeans, um, any kind of greens and grains they can certainly eat. Um, be very careful when you're purchasing the, the starter formulas. A lot of the, the, the feed is actually medicated with either antibiotics or antiparasitics, and you really don't need to give them that. Um, hopefully these birds are getting examined by a veterinarian and checked for parasites and things, but you shouldn't be purchasing the medicated feed that a lot of farms and agricultural um, places will, will just automatically feed all their chickens. Um, and they also need a lot of water. They tend to have higher water requirements. So you want to be sure to make sure they've got a, you know, a big, big, you know, bowl of water that you're keeping track of in case it gets emptied towards the end of the day. So I wanted to touch on some behavioral things about birds that I think anyone who's going to be around them should know. Um, oh, one quick question I want to back up to. Is it safe to house chickens and parrots in the same enclosure or should chickens be separated from parrots? I would keep them separated. Absolutely. I would think that they probably, number one, would be scared of each other. And number two, chickens would be more likely to be carrying some diseases, whether it's parasites or, um, or other things that um, cytosines or parrots are generally not exposed to, so I would definitely keep them separated. That's uh, important. Um, so when you have a bird that is scared or stressed out, that really is a, a big deal for them. Um, not that it's not a big deal for dogs and cats, but birds manifest stress in different ways that can be you know, damaging both to themselves as far as they can um, develop bad feather mutilation or even body mutilation disorders if they're under a lot of stress. And it also makes it so that they are often harder to place in homes if they develop some of these behavior problems. So you want to try from the very start to decrease any signs, any sources of stress. So I wanted to go over some of the ways you're going to be able to detect that. Um, excessive screaming or repetitive alarm call, calls, yeah, birds scream. Yes, they do. It's part of what makes them parrots, but it shouldn't be nonstop and excessive. And the flip side of that is extreme silence. A parrot that never vocalizes is probably terrified to the point that they're, they've lost all their confidence and, and is too scared to make a peep, which is really abnormal. Um, Excessive lethargy or tiredness is, is obviously a sign of illness, but also can be a sign that they're just nervous or scared. Self-injury and feather picking is one of the most obvious ways we know a bird is experiencing stress. It can also be a manifestation of a medical illness, but a lot of times if a bird has been relinquished for whatever reason to a shelter, that's going to be kind of a, a pivotal moment in their lives. They might start um, developing a behavior like self-injury or feather picking. And then any of these stereotypic behaviors that we see sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll see those really sad videos of like elephants pacing and stuff, but birds do it too, pacing back and forth on a perch, thrashing around, chewing abnormally on cage bars, very OCD, obsessive behaviors. Um, 
and extreme aggression where birds will hiss and they, you know, raising up their feathers on their head or their wings. Um, again, some of that can be normal if they're just nervous and they don't know who you are, but doing this over and over again and not getting accustomed to their situation um, can be a sign that something in the room is bothering them. And you need to kind of figure out what that is. You know, the, the idea is we want to minimize that. So reevaluate the housing situation again. Is it is it quiet? Is there something in the home that, I mean, in the uh, room that's stressing them out? Did you, you know, forget and let a cat come in and it's taking a nap underneath its cage? Um, is there some way that that their needs aren't being met, meaning is the caretaker not able to interact with them normally? Is this cage placed in an abnormal situation? Maybe that particular bird doesn't like being near the door, um, or maybe that bird doesn't like being near the window because there's a hawk outside and it's scaring it. Um, you have to really think outside the box a little bit and try to figure out what might be stressing the bird out. Um, try something different. You know, if you don't know, say, well, I don't know what's making this bird nonstop scream, but I'm just going to try something different. So I'll move it to a different area or I'll give it, I'll, I'll cover the cage halfway and see if it needs more privacy. Just try some different techniques and see if you can do something to make it feel more comfortable. And remember that birds can be agitated by things that probably wouldn't bother another animal. Um, certain loud noises, sudden movements. Um, they don't like things that are staring at them. Like I mentioned before, if there's like a hawk outside flying, they, they see that and it scares them terribly. Um, something looming over their cage, like a balloon or a lamp that's kind of hanging over their cage. They don't, they, that freaks them out. They don't like things being over their head. Um, it's funny, people wearing hats or gloves in the bird room, I know that might sound like, well, why would that bother a bird? But I have had birds where if I wear a certain color nail polish, scares the bejesus out of them. I don't know why, but again, you got to think outside the box. If, if you're wearing a hat, a baseball hat, take it off. See if that makes a difference. Maybe it's causing anxiety in a bird for some reason. Yeah. Um, and I have seen many, many birds that are scared of brooms or a large box, a piece of furniture that's getting moved. Um, vacuum cleaners are something that terrifies birds sometimes, different cleaning appliances. So keep all these things in mind, you know, not every bird is going to be scared of these things, but there certainly are many that will. Um, so be, be aware that, that that can affect a bird's stress severely. And some things that you can do to try to minimize stress, if say you can't figure out what's wrong and you're just trying to be creative, well, think about some of these things. Um, you know, they're flock animals. They like being around other birds. So maybe, you know, you should move a bird near a different bird of the same species and see if they might like to be close to each other, not necessarily in the same cage, but just be near each other and enjoying the sights and sounds of having a companion bird near them. Um, as I mentioned, do not separate bonded birds if they're already living together, keep them together. Um, and really, they shouldn't be kept solitary unless they're sick. Uh, hopefully they've, like I mentioned, been vetted and, and examined. And if they're healthy, they generally like being in a room where they can see other birds and have contact with, uh, maybe it's not even the same species of bird, but at least it's another bird in the room for them. Um, I think too that if you're gonna uh, have these birds able to have time outside of the cage, you've gotta remember some of these kind of basic guidelines because yeah it's great if these birds don't have to sit in a cage the entire time they're with you but number one make sure they bird cannot escape from the room um, as i mentioned before open doors open windows anything like that um, make sure that if you're going to take them out the, the staff that's there is comfortable handling a bird you don't want to just open a bird cage and have it climb out and say oh my god what do i do with it now I'm terrified of birds. Make sure that the person who's in charge or is on duty at that time is comfortable having a bird step up on them or isn't scared of them. And then if the bird is tame and really comfortable being handled and willing to come in and out, then absolutely let that bird come out and spend some time with human companionship, walk them around the bird room. Um, you know, it, it might take some time to get to know that bird to figure out if that's the case, but it's worth spending a little time with the bird to see if you can um, if you can handle the bird comfortably. 
And of course, enrichment is a great way to decrease stress for birds. And, and all we're talking about with enrichment is just giving them something to do. Um, birds love to forage. They love to chew things up. They love to rip things apart. Uh, they like to play with things. They like ringing bells. They like rolling around and hiding under newspapers and hiding, you know, hiding inside of a, a little cardboard box. They love to take baths. I mean, how cute is that little Conyer picture where he's in the little Tupperware bath? He's having such a great time. He's like swimming. Um, so remember that and give these birds an opportunity to play, to socialize, um, do things that are natural to them. And that will absolutely make them feel more comfortable while they're in this highly stressful situation. Um, some some um, shelters that I know of will use music, like a little, they'll sometimes have a TV. Some people tell me they like their birds like uh, watching uh, Nickelodeon or, you know, some cartoons or different things like that. So if that's a possibility, um, consider having a radio or a TV or something that the birds will have noise and, I don't know, something to look at, especially if there's not um, a lot of birds in the room with them. And then, you know, if you have a bird that's really talented, and you know you feel like they might want to do some painting. This is also a possibility, and maybe you could then sell these paintings and like make some money for the shelter. I don't know. I've never seen a, a cockatoo uh, or any bird that's been able to do this, but supposedly they exist. So I, I encourage you to keep them busy and, and let them pursue their their artistic pursuits if they if they so desire. Um, so lastly. To kind of recap everything, you know, we really can't replicate the environment that these birds are supposed to live in, unfortunately, when they're in captivity. And, and like Denise mentioned, everybody has their own personal feelings about whether or not these birds should be in captivity or not. But that's not what we're here for today. We're really just trying to do damage control for these birds that are here um, and, and do what we can to keep them as happy and comfortable as possible. Um, and as their caregivers, we really need to see to it that they're allowed to perform just as many as, as we can of their natural daily actions um, while we're while we're um, taking care of them and while they're in our care. And certainly we do have an ethical responsibility to provide the absolute best care that we can for them um, while we have them in captivity, even if it's just short term in the, in the shelter. And that's all I've got. I'm going to read through all your questions if I missed any, and um, and I'll certainly answer any of them. Thank you so much, Lorelai. While you're kind of reading through those questions, I just want to kind of make some closing remarks, um, and then we can follow up with any questions you think you might have missed. You did a great job of keeping up with all the questions. I appreciate that. Um, but I do want to say again, thank you to everybody for attending. As I mentioned, we will follow up with um, an email with information about the recording, the next webinar in the series, and a uh, follow-up survey. So definitely be watching for that. Um, again, we really appreciate your taking the time to be here. And thank you so much, Lorelai. It was a great presentation, um, a lot of really great information. So I'll go ahead. If Denise has any follow-up comments or Lorelai, if you have any follow-up comments or saw any questions you want to address that you missed, feel free to do that. Um, well, I would just like to mention that um, uh, we uh, have some downloadable new posters um, on, that would be great to put up in the shelter, uh, which is on our website at um, on our downloadable flyers and fact sheets. So if you go to uh, avianwelfare.org and click on the link for that. Um, this this is specifically for there there are quick sheets that you could download and put up in your shelter. Um, they're called the five F's to better bird welfare. And Lorelai, did you have any follow-up comments or see any questions you want to follow up on? Um, reading through, let's see. Somebody mentioned um, something about aloe um, here because we I mentioned aloe and not you know I said something to be silly like it doesn't rain aloe, it rains water. And they mentioned that tap water is not as 
soft as rainwater. Certainly in some areas, tap water can be harder or softer depending on where you are and how the water is treated. Um, and they mentioned that aloe can be beneficial to deal with dry, itchy skin caused by being indoor conditions, especially in the winter when our indoor air is so dry. I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns and say I don't think we should be spraying anything on birds other than water. But that being said, it is true that it is so, so dry. And that leads me to mention um, the idea of getting humidifiers or increasing the humidity is a great idea for people with birds. Even in a shelter setting, it, it helps them so much with, um, as she mentioned, dry skin and, and itchiness. You know, you want to, these birds are meant to be in an area that is high, high humidity in the, you know, 80% humidity range. And, you know, and right now in New York City, where I am, the humidity is about, I don't know, 22%. So getting humidifiers is going to be really helpful. Um, aloe is not toxic to birds. It's not that I think it's dangerous to use. I just don't like putting things on birds' feathers that might cause them any, re give them any reason to taste it or feel sticky or uncomfortable in any way that might make them over groom um, and potentially start having feather destructive behavior. Um, but I think that's the only question I'm seeing here. I'll have to look through and like I said, we'll, I'll, I'll email answers that I didn't get through here. Thank you again so much, Lorelai. Um, I appreciate that and we'll Definitely make sure to get this to you so that you can see if you've missed any questions you'd like to follow up on. So okay. okay. again, thank you so much everybody for attending. And again, thank you, Lorelai, for a great presentation. Um, so then I will go ahead. I'll leave the room open for a couple more minutes in case anybody needs to get any final comments in the chat. But other than that, I will say I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Thanks very much. Everybody. Thank you. Bye.